All right. So I've got 11 o'clock central time, so we can go ahead and get started. Again, the uh, recording will be available. So for anyone who jumps in late or misses this, we'll share this, share this out. Uh, so today I am with uh, guest Vinny Polito, expert on 340B uh, drug pricing. And I think we're going to have an interesting discussion. I will admit this is not a topic that I... Um, I'm certainly an expert on, but that's really the whole point of doing these is to bring on subject matter experts. So uh, we'll blend our experiences and and certainly there's a Q&A. So we'll have 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. If you think of any questions, uh, as far as I can tell, the chat is open as well. If it's not, I will fix that. I am still learning these webinars, so please bear with me. And the difference between the webinars and the podcast, right? So podcasts are recorded only where these webinars give us kind of a live effect, which is maybe a little more fun as well. So forgive me if there's any uh, glitches, but I think I'm getting better at that. Okay, so I see a note, it's open, so cool. So I'm gonna intro it with this. And uh, so this will just, and then we'll, then we're gonna hear from Vinny and Vinny, I'll ask you to give maybe just kind of an introduction of your background, which I think is fascinating. Uh, so 340B drug pricing is the topic. For more than 30 years, the 340B drug pricing program has provided financial help to hospitals serving vulnerable communities to manage rising prescription drug costs. Section 340B of the Public Health Service Act requires pharmaceutical manufacturers participating in Medicaid to sell outpatient drugs at discounted prices to healthcare organizations that care for many uninsured and low-income patients. The program allows 340B hospitals to stretch limited federal resources to reduce the price of outpatient pharmaceuticals for patients and expand health services to patients and communities they serve. Hospitals use 340B savings to provide, for example, free care for uninsured patients, offer free vaccines, provide services in mental health clinics, and implement medication management and community health programs. So that was taken from an AHA article. Uh, so that's um, their view, of course. We all have our own views and own per our own perspectives. But Vinny, if you'd like to maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, and we can jump right in. Sure. So um, I, uh, I've, I'm, a, I'm a pharmacist by training. I've been practicing pharmacy since 2007, although I, uh, I haven't been really behind the counter in a couple of years, and I don't know if, uh, if, if you necessarily want to see me there. Uh, because I got into pharmacy administration a little over a decade ago. Um, I've worked as a hospital pharmacist, as a pharmacy director for small, medium, large hospitals and for a large hospital system here in Colorado. I'm located uh, just east of Boulder, just north of Denver. And uh, so my focus was um, uh, especially starting at a critical access hospital as a pharmacy director. My, my first week uh, in the role, the CFO pulled me aside and he said, hey, just FYI, we're going to be financially insolvent within the next three years. I heard we're eligible for this 340B program. I'm not really sure what that means, but if you could figure it out, that would be great. Uh, so that's um, how I was thrust into learning 340B. It was literally to try to save the largest employer in the county. Um, so my, uh, my background in, in learning the program it, it has been mostly developed on, on trying to figure out how to, how to best optimize uh, the use of, of 340B drug discount savings at the hospitals. And I can kind of walk through uh, how that works, but I, I, think we should, I think we should go back. And I know that you kind of mm -hmm. mentioned a little bit of the background in the, in the AHA article, but um, I, I think it's always good to, to have a quick discussion on the history of 340B. Um, just so folks can kind of have some context around it. So it, it actually starts two years before the development of the 340B program uh, in 1990 with the Medicaid drug rebate program. This was essentially a, a way for um, the federal government to empower states to um, get savings on rising prescription drug costs. And it was basically this, hey, you as the state Medicaid agency, have the ability to, ability to tap into the exact same rebates that the market is negotiating with drug manufacturers. If that drug manufacturer wants to participate in, um, uh, in Medicaid as a payer for their drug or Medicare Part B as a payer for their drug, then they have to offer you, at the very least, the best available rebate that you're offering anybody else in the market. 
So um, it was just a very quick way for the states to not even have to negotiate their own rebates. They just basically get most favored nation pricing. Um, and even in the absence of negotiated rebates in the market, state Medicaid agencies can still get um, some some rebate pricing on there. So that's the that's sort of the the basis of this. Um, and so that's 1990. And and Congress looks at that and they say, hey, this is a pretty good funding mechanism to, to help tackle rising drug costs. Um, that's helping our states be able to manage their their bills. Uh, what about these, um, what a lot of people refer to as safety net providers, but what we like to refer to as essential community providers. Uh, what are we doing to sort of help them financially? Because they're taking, uh, I, I mean, think of wherever it is in the in the major metro that you live near that is taking all the gunshot wounds and stab wounds. Those are your, you know, your truest safety nets. Um, but also a lot of um, uh, a lot of our essential community providers uh, are federally qualified health centers um, that that serve high proportions of uninsured or Medicaid patients. And so, uh, Congress basically said, "Hey, we've got these um, we've got this safety net that we need to be able to support. We don't want to raise taxes to be able to support them. We actually love this funding mechanism that the states are using with Medicaid drug rebate program because it's not it's not straight tax dollars. It's discounts given from the drug manufacturers who are partially responsible for these rising costs. So we'd like to take that same framework. Uh, and since they're not the payers, they are the, they are those that are provisioning the care. It, it, it doesn't really work to have it be paid back as a rebate because um, they're not the payer. They, they're buying the drugs in the first place. We may as well just give them that discount up front. And so in 1992, as part of the Public Health Service Act, as you mentioned, Congress stepped in and said, the whole point of this program is to stretch scarce federal resources uh, to allow these providers to, to serve their communities better. Um, there's a lot there's a lot of language out there in the ether right now that's mostly pharma sponsored that says, hey, this program was developed to give patients discounts. It's not true. It's developed to help these hospitals and community providers stay in business um, and to be able to provide services that otherwise they wouldn't provide. Um, a lot of uh, the, and, and it's only nonprofits, um, which uh, to some would get an eye roll uh, because they say, well, nonprofit hospital, how exactly is, you know, um, you know, Advocate Aurora nonprofit, like nonprofit as far as taxes are concerned. But oh, lots of questions um, there. Yeah. 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 Lots of questions there. One, one quick, uh, just, interjection here is that could you uh, just for foundational purposes could you also include as you introduce this which drugs are covered so i noticed like in this little intro i read it says outpatient so i'm curious about like infusions and what's considered outpatient and then uh yeah so that's i think that's the yeah. biggest thing i wanted to get in there really good point um so out outpatient drugs are the only ones that are covered so that would not con that would not include mm -hmm. any drugs dispensed on a patient staying more than twenty four hours in a hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, so so those are discluded. Um, again, any drug where the manufacturer does not participate in Medicare Part B or uh, in Medicaid mm -hmm. um, is not included because it's not part of the Medicaid drug rebate program. So mm -hmm. there's a, a couple of drugs that fall into that category. I, I believe. Expirel, there's some cosmetic drugs that that fall into yeah. that category, but it's very, very few drugs that that are just excluded. Right. Um, so basically any drug that is either dispensed to a patient in an outpatient location, including infusion drugs at a hospital, or um, just as importantly, handed to a pa patient to administer at home. And that's probably the bigger basis behind our discussion today, especially with an audience more on the side of the payers and the brokers and consultants and employers. Um, because the program basically says, hey, you're giving this discount on this drug to the provider that is seeing the patient. Um, and what the manufacturer has basically negotiated is, hey, we're only giving one discount one way or another. So if it's a rebate, it's a rebate. If it's an upfront discount, it's an upfront discount, but there's only one to be had. 
So um, if a hospital buys a drug at a 340B price, that discount has been taken. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you are going to pay for uh, a, a drug where a patient has gotten infusion at a hospital and you you don't know if that's 340B or not, you're just paying for that. But you sort of expect your rebate to come in the mail after the fact, right? You're saying, hey, I've got a negotiated rebate. This is what my PBM does the work for. This is what my medical insurer does the work for negotiating rebates. So I'm expecting my check in the mail and it doesn't come or worse, it comes and then it gets clawed back because the manufacturer says, hey, now we have actually matched your claim to a 340B purchase. So there's no two discounts to be given. They take the discount up front. I can't give you a rebate. So that's where it has really hit the, the forefront. So if, if, tell me if I frame this correctly. And so I, right, so we have the seller, which is the manufacturers of the drug, and they seem to be the burden here as being part of that government program. This is part of the, what they have to do. We have the reimburser in some, in many cases, or most cases in the middle, some, some, I think, confusingly call the insurance carrier, the payer. And I always want to want to make sure that we bring that to light. They are the reimburser. They're not paying. I mean, they're, there are the middle, uh, you know, maybe writing checks, but the real payers of, of the commercial side are the employers and the employees that pay a portion. Uh, that's where all the money is sourced. So I had uh, testified in a Senate hearing oh, coming up on a couple of years ago, and it was interesting because the white, the hospital was um, uh, lobbying for white bagging to be outlawed so that they wanted to purchase the drug, buy and bill, and then um, and maybe we can talk about that as we get into that market up significantly. Uh, and then the insurance was on the other side and then they were, and what I didn't realize even until later, a year plus later is that they were really, uh, fighting for their, uh, take to, so that they could mark up the drug so that they could. Uh, and so this was, this was the, the not an employers losing and, and we were kind of sitting on the insurance side as the employer representative, but there was no win in that. Uh, I guess we, I think if we had to pick, we, we won, we stopped a bill to outlaw white bagging that was trying to, um, but man alive. So we're, so we have these entities, these industry entities fighting for their share of significant markup of these drugs that maybe cost five or 6,000 in many cases are marked up five times plus. Um, so there's kind of, as you know, I have the employer perspective, the payer perspective, and I think that's often forgotten in the mix of of these discussions. Um, any insight on that or thoughts on that? Yeah. I, I, um, and I'll, I'll definitely get into this a little bit more. Okay. Here's the ironic thing. Uh, a, a lot of folks that say, well, wait a second, every time I lose out on uh, a rebate due to 340B, they, they look to the hospitals and they say, hey, you're, you're being predatory here. You're going out of your way to try to snag as, as many 340B transactions for exactly what you said. They're using um, a, a better cost basis to, to improve profit margin on those particular drugs. The actual operators, 98 times out of 100, have no idea that you're losing your rebate. They have no idea. They're just looking at this from a hospital operations standpoint and saying, we're eligible for this program. Hmm. I can buy these drugs at a cheaper price if it's in these departments or written by these doctors. So I, I, I'm going to try to leverage that as much as possible. They have no idea that you're losing your rebate on the back end. They have no idea on, on the effect uh, uh, to the consumer besides the effect of the markup over the normal cost of the drug, which is already high. And that's, that's a completely different story. So um, quick, quick question within that. So what determines the price that the hospital gets for 340B pricing? Mm. If they're on the program, what determines, yeah. do they get it? Great question. They have, you know, what determines that? Yeah. So, so the base discount rate for a generic drug is 13.1% for a brand name drug is 23.1% for blood factors and some other children's drugs. It's like 17.1% discount. However, that is superseded um, if there is a better negotiated rebate in the market, because again, that sort of base determination was off the Medicaid drug rebate program. So, Hey, if, Optum or Caremark has already negotiated a 40% discount for that brand name medication. That's the discount that you get. But then there's one more little caveat here. And this is what I find the most interesting. So there is, there is an additional pricing penalty 
that is in place for manufacturers that raise the price of that particular drug beyond the rate of inflation the previous quarter. So basically, the longer a brand name drug has been on the market and the more that that manufacturer has essentially predatorily raised the prices beyond the rate of inflation, the cheaper the drug is on 340B. All the way down to at, at the, the very largest discount that you can give is basically a 99.9% .9 discount. They can't give it away and pay you, but there are drugs that we call penny drugs because they've been on the market a long time and they cost way more than they should. Um, and Humira is a perfect example. It's a penny drug. I can buy a Humira syringe for a penny. Uh, and through, usually you're paying, you know, 5,000 bucks for a month's supply. Could we go through kind of a, a somewhat of a hypothetical, but a real life example of, of how this affects seller, you know, manufacturer, insurance sure. carrier, buyer. I think that would be interesting to see. Yeah. So let's, uh, um, let's make sure that we outline um, another major use of 340B, which is for outpatient drugs outside of being used in a hospital or being used in a, in a grantees clinic, like a federally qualified health centers clinic. Mm -hmm. um, if you have an eligible 340B location, hospital or clinic, um, that prescribes a drug for a patient, and that drug is filled by an eligible pharmacy, either owned by that entity or a pharmacy with whom that entity has contracted with. So Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid, any, any pharmacy out in the ether, um, if they've contracted with them to say, hey, we're going to utilize 340B drugs uh, for eligible patients, then it's not a direct discount up front um, with a markup as much as it is, hey, there's a transaction that occurs at an outpatient pharmacy for a prescription and you, you're replacing that drug to their shelf with a 340B drug in exchange for some of that savings that's generated, basically what's been paid less the cost of that 340B drug. And, and so in that case, it's less of a savings program and more of a revenue generator. Because if you think of it, I'm a hospital that otherwise one of my doctors writes a prescription and it goes over to CVS. I don't get anything for that, right? It's just It just goes over there. They make their normal profit margin on it. But if I can extend 340B and I've got such a stronger cost basis, I can say, hey, CVS, if you normally make $20 per prescription, I'll give you $30 per prescription if you take my 340B drug and put it back on your shelf and share the rest of that savings with me. So CVS looks at that and they say, yeah, we, we like that because we're making a little bit more. The hospital looks at that because they're generating revenue on a prescription that otherwise they wouldn't generate any revenue on. And, and to them, it's sort of payer agnostic because the payer still looks at that and they say, hey, I'm getting charged the same price. Mm -hmm. I got the same, you know, uh, payer payment, same copay insurance or, or co-insurance for the patient. So at the point of sale, it looks like any other transaction. And so you know, the hospital and the pharmacy, they say, this is a good thing. You know, we're we're leveraging savings to get some additional profitability out of the market. But then on the back end, payer loses that rebate. So so it's not exactly, um, you know, ag ag agnostic. It's it's not neutral. Um, the You know, the manufacturer loses always, um, but the, the payer also loses on the rebate. Right. Yeah, I think uh, and Tebow comes to mind as well. You know, uh, and I don't think, you know, and we we touched on this, I don't think in, in terms of these nonprofits, that's a real, that's a whole nother discussion, right? And we won't go there, but there's an assumption on the tail end that they're, because they're not paying a, a penny in taxes to that community, that they're serving that community and then taking care of those who can't afford to pay and giving that percentage of charity care. And we know that's a great question. I mean, that's again, another topic for another day. So that's right. Isn't that the premise behind this? So that, but then when we, when we get into hospitals, then when they're, when they're taking the benefits, this government benefit or this, right, this penny drugs, but they're not giving that. Now we have, now we have another issue. We have a, uh, right, a kind of a bad actor situation where you're supposed to be taking care of your community, but you're taking advantage, you're, you're profiting from that situation. But there was an Antivo uh, tell me if this is accurate, but Intibo can be purchased for something uh, which is for Crohn's disease. 
something like $6,500 buy-in bill, say direct from an infusion center. Would that apply here? And so like maybe we'll take out the pharmacy just in this example mm -hmm. to keep it simple as on a J-code infused drug. Would that be a case where the hospital could also buy that drug for a penny? Because we've seen that we the, a, a, maybe an independent can purchase in TiVo for 6,500, but then, we, and this is per sitting, this is per sitting, which is something like the first three or like every eight weeks, and then it goes to a different, little bit different schedule, but a, a lot of infusions throughout the year, but they're charging 25,000 per sitting. So here the payer is getting run over by a Mack truck. And if, and so, right, it's just, it's, I don't think anybody, at least I can speak for myself. I don't have any issue with taking care of nonprofit hospitals if they're living out their mission and they're for the community. But I think in just many cases, that's in question. So could you touch on maybe that in TiVo example or a, at least a J code sure. example? And, and how so, to, how so yeah, if the, if the normal cost of Intivio is $6,500, it totally mm -hmm. depends on, it totally depends on the location, what their markup is, what their charge master says. Right. And it, it, you really have to understand pharmacy economics because in a hospital, there are really only a handful of revenue generating departments, if you think about it, because a lot of departments within a hospital are sort of their cost centers they are not revenue generators. And so it's it's not exactly I, I, I don't think it's exactly fair to say, well, hey, it's you know, this pharmacy is marking up, you know, big time in a vacuum to say, well, that's not fair because the, their costs for that are significantly lower because you, you also have to say, well, they have a bunch of other costs that are not reimbursed um, that are in different cost centers that are um, that, that are a drag on their revenue. So, so like imaging lab pharmacy procedures, that's what generates revenue for a hospital. Everything else is a cost. So, that's where the hospital will say, hey, you know, we're, we're using this to offset our costs. But I, I, I really want to I really want to address the 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 premise that there are, are bad actors. And, I, and I'll tell you, there are bad actors in, in any situation. I mean, um, there there are secret handshake deals that are made, as, as Matt is well aware, um, in the consultant and broker world with PBMs and with medical insurers. It, it, it's. There's a lot of bad actors. Anytime that you have one party that has information that another party doesn't have, uh, they can take advantage of that. Um, with 340B, there's an opportunity for that same uh, that same problem because you have pricing that is available only to you as an entity that's proprietary. Um, and so I don't know if Antivio is a penny price drug. I know that at the very least, it's 23.1% off the rack rate at, three, at 340B. And it's been around for many years. It's not cheap, so it's probably closer to 50 plus percent discount on 340B, but the hospital doesn't have to share that information with you. So, so uh, can they take, yeah, can you take advantage of that? Uh, absolutely. Um, but I, I will say that just because you're a nonprofit hospital does not mean that you qualify for 340B. So you do have to meet certain criteria if you're a hospital uh, that says, I actually have proven on paper that I serve a disproportionately high number of low pay and no pay patients. It's mostly Medicaid patients and supplemental Medicare patients that go into that, that calculation. Um, can that be gained? Yes, absolutely. So you could say, hey, I have a hospital that's located in a really low income area of town, but I, you know, I'm an integrated hospital system that has another hospital across town that has a rheumatology clinic and a cancer center and, uh, you know, a GI clinic. And I want to take hospitals status that's down in the tough area of town and extend it out to this sort of more well-to-do area or area with other specialists or infusion or other services where I could use 340B. You can do that. And there have been a couple of hospitals that have, have gotten publicly tied in the face um, for uh, for essentially doing that by saying, hey, you're, you know, you're you're really extending this outside of, of this hospital. Um, and so really in any situation, you can have bad actors. Uh, and I'm not one to come in and point fingers and say everybody's doing bad things or, hey, everybody's on the up and up. It's 
um, some level of transparency is probably a good thing uh, to be able to at the very least show, um, hey, I'm getting 340B savings. What am I doing to extend um, you know, care to my patients in my community? Yeah, and I think I I appreciate your your tone and your approach, right? Because the same goes here. Neither of us are here to throw stones. Part of the part of the problem is though with healthcare, the more the digger you deep, right? And I I think this is pretty fair to say the digger we, the deeper we dig. There we go. Uh, the more the darker it gets. And so I we have an industry that hasn't been regulated we have non-profit hospital which is every house every large healthcare system in wisconsin and there are i'll say it very politely there are a hundred questions in terms of their practice the regulation seems to be failing um as we see egregious examples of of gouging and so forth uh putting patients second and caught and profits first uh, the organization called uh, HRSA, Health Resources Services Administration, according to my somewhat layman knowledge, honestly, on this topic, is stated, at least in this article, as the regulating agency. Um, to your knowledge, what level are is this 340B? As you said, the public doesn't have visibility what the hospital pays, at least for the 340B pricing. Uh, they certainly have visibility on the, on the on what they're billed. Uh, what the claim, you know, the claim comes through in total, but how how much is this being regulated just in your opinion? Or is this maybe, um, maybe slipping through the cracks? Actually, actually fairly highly regulated. Um, and HRSA, which is a, de a department of health and human services, uh, it's an administrative arm of HHS. They oversee the program. They oversee auditing the program. And I've been through HRSA audits on the hospital side and they are, uh, very, very deeply detailed. They want to make sure that, A, you have controls in place to make sure that you're only purchasing drugs where 340B is appropriate. Uh, they've got very clear guidelines that say who who is allowed to register, what does that registration look like, how can you utilize that registration, and HRSA is the one that created the ability for hospitals and health centers to contract with third-party pharmacies. In fact, there was a recent court decision in November um, when when HRSA had been uh, over-regulating what the definition of a patient was. I shouldn't say over -regulated. They Their interpretation uh, of what a patient was was actually put into question by a federally qualified health center uh, called Genesis Health Services in South Carolina. They said, hey, you know, we are taking care of our patients. We're obviously nonprofit. We're grant funded. We're serving high, high uninsured patients. And your the way that you're auditing our program um, is, is very, very thorough. And you've uh, you've given us infractions um, and and threatened to kick us out of this 340B program. Um, and, and we want to go back and challenge this in court. And the judge actually went back to the original 340B statute. And he said, this program was not put in place to to be limited in scope, to have patients definition limited in scope, a patient is a patient. If you're taking care of this patient, they're your patient. Um, and the program was designed to leverage the savings to generate profits for hospitals and clinics. And that was stated by the judge. And and, and it was a, a pretty key precedent because drug manufacturers over the years have really tried to sort of change that narrative to, hey, this is supposed to be you know, extending discounts to needy patients. Oftentimes hospitals do that. Uh, if they have uninsured patients um, that they can get 340B drugs on, they will oftentimes extend that discount to the patient. But um, the, the really tricky part is, even though it's very, very highly regulated, so, uh, the statute was written in 1992. Even though HRSA has some guidelines to, to how they've interpreted it over the last, you know, several years, this is a 32 year old program uh, written with very, very loose language prior to specialty pharmacies even existing. Um, and those are now more than 50% of your pharmacy spend, even though it's a tiny fraction of your actual prescriptions. So um, it's totally different in the way that we administer healthcare today than we did in 1992. Yeah, and thank you for that that clarification. I mean, it's my interpretation of what you said is that, right, this program 
um, was intended to help the uh, nonprofit uh, hospitals, especially that serve the community. And they're supposed to take care of that community. And while there isn't a direct relationship in terms of maybe get the drug low or free and give it away low or free, I don't see I'm lacking a direct connection there. There's supposed to be at least an indirect connection that you're taking care of that community. You're, you're certainly helping the patients who deserve help. And maybe that leads to the latter big question mark, right? Uh, again, another, we won't dig into that. So, but the, the focus today is the 340B specifically. Um, maybe a question that I'll actually, and, um, we're not at Q and a time, but who cares, right? So we're making the rules. Um, but you know, this was a question I was going to ask anyway, and I see it in the Q and a, so I'm going to ask it. Um, it's, here's one basically, how can employers, uh, what can employer, is there anything employers can do to leverage this program? Uh, but the specific question is, can you clarify whether there's a savings opportunity that can be passed along to employers for things like infusions? by leveraging the 340B program outside of the hospital setting. So that's even getting one yeah, more. The answer is yes. So so yeah. um, what I, I I guess I probably should have shared was a after many, many years working in hospital pharmacy administration, uh, I was uh, recruited to go over to Optum to run 340B strategy for the PBM. Um, and w one of the really key things is, especially if, if you are a 340B entity, this was the strangest thing to me. There's so much of a disconnect between the sort of the, the payment of services and then the provision of 340B services that those that are really utilizing the 340B discounts are only focused on saving money on transactions that are occurring within that facility. If the 340B entity is the employer that is looking for you know employer sponsored coverage in the market then they really should be maximizing 340b they should be doing whatever they can for their own employees to get 340b because the the 340b discount especially for for um you know these drugs that have gone up beyond the rate of inflation they're cheaper on 340b than any rebate that you're going to negotiate so yes if if you are the hospital that is 340b you should have programs in place to try to get your employees that are high cost into, you know, 340B eligible situations so that you can save on your costs. And what I learned over at Optum was that's oftentimes not the fact at all. Uh, in fact, the, the benefits department within hospitals, even major large hospital systems, they're just focused and oftentimes they are um, incentivized to maximize rebates, similar to how, you know, brokers and, and some other intermediaries are incentivized to maximize rebates because that's how they're, that's how they're paid is I'm able to collect X number of rebates. So I'm able to beat last year's rebate figure by blank. And so I get a bonus off of that. Um, and, and that was the weirdest thing was going to them and saying, Hey, like, why do you care about getting, you know, a 40% rebate back on Chimera if the pharmacy down the hall that you own can get for a penny. Like, why would you fight them on that? Oh, because we're, we're losing our rebates. Yeah, but they're, you're getting a 99.9% .9 rebate. Like, what? This is, the, this is a silly fight. You should be focused on savings. You should be focused on savings. And it, it doesn't have to be limited to the employer is the 340B provider. Um, it could be, hey, I'm looking to control my healthcare costs and I'm I'm interested in actually going to a 340B provider and saying, hey, I know that you can leverage your savings on this. Um, I, I would exchange my you know patient volumes for a reasonable discount on those drugs since I know that you're you're doing better on those drugs compared to other peers. Now, that's sort of the main reason that, you know, I, I I ended up in the role that I'm in right now, which is we we are actually working with federally qualified health centers, which are clinics, to say, hey, you know, hospital markups for infusion, whether you're 340B or not, are really, really high. Um, but even ambulatory infusion centers, home infusion, doctor's office infusion, um, they're buying these drugs at a higher cost base than, than you could. 
Um, and, and these federally qualified health centers, only only three out of 1,400 do infusions. So we're coming in and saying, hey, well, we, we understand that infusions is really hard. We'll help you build that out. We'll help you build out that capability. But at, at the same time, we'll go out to the market and we'll basically say, hey, we can undercut just about any competition out there because we have a cost basis that they don't have. Um, we can save an employer 5%, 10% on, on, on their um, uh, on their costs for these infusion drugs, really, really high dollar drugs um, in exchange for steerage. That's kind of the whole point. Like it doesn't have to be limited to, hey, the hospital is just marking it up and taking everything. They could share some of it back the clinic could share some of it back. Um, it's it's at their discretion. So um, it, it's a really good point that you made. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking of um, you know. I mean, it's it's a fascinating topic. I, I think in terms of right, we see the fiduciary responsibilities coming to light through the recent CAA, and there were already ERISA things in place. We had the first lawsuit of its kind where actually a Wisconsin employee has filed a class action against Johnson & Johnson, ironically, a drug right, company. Um, but but it wasn't in regard to that. It was regard more in regard to specifically as an employer. So an employer now has been sued by an employee. Uh, overall, you know, this article, it seems to be what, you know, maybe the question is, I'm not, I don't have the pieces in my mind together yet, but what is an expert in healthcare? And you could take it from an advisory perspective, an advisor, a forward-thinking advisor, uh, or, or the employer, you know, the director of total rewards is commonly the title inside. Uh, I think that's maybe the most valuable position in a company that doesn't exist, by the way, as a head of benefits reporting to the CEO, in my opinion. Uh, it's the second or third largest cost. But it seems to me in my 25 years in HR and, and working in large companies across the nation that an expert within a company, and even you could say an advisor maybe is mixed in, an expert in healthcare is uh, an expert on networks, an expert on deductibles, an expert on premiums, an expert on EOBs, and and the like. And uh, what we think I what I think we need to realize is that um, that kind of an expert won't get you very far in today's environment. That that's the in game that the insurance industry has handed you, and you're playing it but you don't even really maybe realize you're playing the wrong game, right? There's a, there's a saying, don't spend your whole life climbing the ladder of success and then realize it's the wrong ladder. Uh, but I think we're playing the wrong game. And, and I think it's these kinds of discussions and questions that we ask to say, what can I actually do to shop wisely for healthcare, to shop for value, quality, cost, and accessibility? And it doesn't appear to me that many employers are understanding at these levels and there is a lot of maybe win-wins out there for this for a hospital, for instance, that's eligible for 340B to work out an arrangement with an employer or a group of employers or coalition or co-op or right these independent networks that they could purchase these drugs at lower cost. The hospital still wins, find a fair price. And today it just feels right like the hospitals jack it up. They're getting beat up in other areas, maybe by insurance. And then the payer always seems to lose. So um, if anyone has any insight on that topic, please send it to me because I think that might be my next article and I, I don't have it in my head yet, but what we're really talking about is employers, the payers managing their health plans, or they're going to get sued. Uh, I think more are coming. So any insight on that, Vinny, in terms of what you've seen your hospital, right? I forget the title, but it had come to you and said, we're not doing this well. We're not purchasing well. We need to make sure we're doing it well. And there, maybe there's a win-win there for the buyer as well. Yeah. And I also want to address, and Jacob, I see your comment here in the chat. Um, the, the trickiest part here is negotiation is all based on supply and demand. And if you're the only hospital in the neighborhood, you don't have to give any discount. If you don't really want to, you're the only player, right? You're the only place for somebody, somebody to go to. Yeah, right. um, if you're in a saturated market where there are other players and there are other options, then you can at the very least, again, in theory, um, use that to your advantage by saying, hey, uh, instead of sending my patient to your competition, I'll send them to you if you know, you'll know you give me X, you're the preferred provider. Or 
or I will incentivize the patient. I'll give them no out of pocket um, to go to you. Um, and they'll have to pay $200 for that infusion to go to hospital or clinic down the street. So um, if if you're able to, to, to negotiate this with me. Um, and in, in, in general, that's, that's completely doable. In practice, it's, it's really not. And, and that really comes down to 340B providers saying, Hey, wait a second, this program was not intended for us to share a discount with anybody. It was intended for us to stretch scarce resources and use this discount. Um, but to, to some other providers that are eligible for 340B, you might say, hey, like, I'd be interested in getting into a unique relationship with you for really high dollar specialty drugs, where you now are taking care of my patient, and otherwise, you wouldn't have my patient. Um, and you now are writing for this specialty drug that you can generate revenue on that otherwise, you wouldn't get anything because you wouldn't have my volumes. And I'd like to get into an arrangement with you to share in a portion of that savings. And that, that's that been something that uh, I'll, I'll tell you, one of the really big key drug categories here is hemophilia, where, I mean, if, you have, if you're an employer with one hemophiliac, that could be 10, 20% of your costs, um, depending on how, how large you are as an employer. So if, if you go to a 340B eligible entity and say, hey, I have this one hemophiliac, I will fly them to you for care, or I will transport them to you, or I will fly you to that, whatever it needs to be to enter into an arrangement with you such that they are your patient and you have an auditable record um, in exchange for some reprieve on these incredible drug costs. There are providers that have done that, that have said, okay, we'll work. It's That's not necessarily part of our normal specialty, but we'll work with that patient specialist. We'll bring that patient in. We'll provide wraparound care and yeah, we'll we'll share a portion of that savings back with you. Does that good? I'm glad that that kind of answers your question, Jacob. I think that's yeah, fascinating, right? I mean these these are these are not easy things, and it's a great question, right? Wouldn't wouldn't we have to go and get the hospital to agree or the clinics to agree? Yes, and some of that what gets their attention, right? So this this is one of the as my co-founder jokes, madisms, right? But this I've done this from the start at Merrill Steel. These win-win situations. And what we find is these monopolistic situations in the healthcare environment today with hospitals even acquiring and merging faster than we can keep track of, that's really bad for the consumer. But we're finding that we can outsource 70% of say outpatient services throughout the state and, and even in the nation in many cases. Um, so what that is, it's creating this free market shopping. You gotta compete for the, the sell, for the buyers. The sellers have to compete for the buyers. Very healthy. But I think if hospitals aren't taking advantage of the 340B, even if they are, I think they would be interested in volume. There just has to be an alternative or, or they've got you, right? So these, well, sometimes we try to out-negotiate our partners. We go and we say, I got them. I got the win, they got the lose. Well, what about one year later? What about one year later when they're losing? What do you think they're going to do, right? They're going to be out. I always like to say right there at that table to say, one year from now, we're both going to ask if this is a good thing for us. And if it is, we'll smile in a year and we'll keep going. But if it's not, we're just going to drop out. We can, no one can lose forever. And so I think that is an uphill challenge in terms of getting a hospital, maybe to agree to an agreement like that. But we know that the the big insurance, as we call the BUCAs, I think are against that kind of thing. And they're and the hospitals in many cases are beholden to them because they bring the flow of patients. So they've got the power. The hospitals need to sell their services. So if we open up this free market, then we can begin to have more discussions like that where they're not beholden to them, that they're actually now have many buyers from many different angles. And so the more the free market movement takes off, the more those discussions, I think, become possible. So yeah. That's there, and there's a, I know we're kind of in Q&A time and, and mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of questions and I, I want to try to address some of these as much as I can. Um, it, would that be appropriate to kind of start that now, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. So I, I think this first question, clarifying whether we can pass along savings to employers, I think we talked about that a little bit. It totally, again, it totally depends on the 340B provider. Um, and that's why there are organizations like, you know, what my company is doing and there are other companies that are out there that are going and partnering with 340B providers and like not hospital 340B providers to say, hey, 
you have advantages here with this program. We can extend some new volumes in your door in exchange for some share of the savings. Um, yeah, Greg, it looks like we answered your question. Um, the perspective on J&J &J and the Consolidated Appropriations Act with 340B. So, um, you know, to, to answer this question, I, I think I want to answer one of, one of the below questions as well, because we're talking about um, validating 340B claims. So this, this all comes back to who has the information. Here's how it works when you're a 340B provider. You really don't know in real time what's 340B. Be if it's a prescription that's filled in an outside pharmacy, because the outside pharmacy has their own pharmacy record system. It's not tied in with your record system. If your hospital has a pharmacy down on the first floor, yeah, you know in real time what's 340B mm -hmm. because you can see the prescription um, that's being filled and you can see the visit that occurred that is from an eligible provider in an eligible location within an eligible time, time frame. So you can connect that right away. If it's an outside pharmacy, you don't have enough information to make that connection. And the pharmacy isn't going to let you just have access to their pharmacy record system. And this has given rise to what's called third-party administrators, which means something else usually in the health benefits world. But in the 340B world, there are TPAs as well. They basically come in and say, hey, hospital, hey, pharmacy, we're going to act as a clearinghouse. We're going to act as escrow. Or we're gonna we're gonna sit right between your two record systems and we're gonna translate the information coming in from either end and say, hey, I see this transaction for Michael J. Fox from this pharmacy on this date. It's a contracted pharmacy, and I see an eligible encounter on this date for Michael J. Fox, same date of birth for that same drug being written out of this 340B clinic. We're gonna match it, we're gonna reconcile and say, okay, pharmacy, you get to keep this much as your dispense fee. And hospital, we're going to initiate a shipment of that drug over to pharmacy, and then we're going to take basically the share of the payment that goes back to the hospital and give it to them. That's what a TPA does. So the hospital themselves has no idea what's, what is occurring over at the pharmacy because once I send a prescription out, I don't know if it's getting filled. I don't know if the insurance says, no, that's not on formulary. You can't use, like, I have no idea. So I, I can't reconcile that information. As the PBM, I also don't know it's 340B, even if I'm the PBM-owned pharmacy. So let's say that I am a Credo, Express Scripts um, Specialty Pharmacy, and I am a 340B contract pharmacy of a hospital. I might not even know that a transaction was 340B until a, a third-party administrator um, replenishes that drug to my shelf, and that might be weeks later. Right. So so if I'm the PBM here I, ESI, I, I, I'm billing the insurance company and I, uh, for a rebate or not insurance. I'm billing the uh, manufacturer for a rebate because I, I don't see that this is a 340B transaction because I haven't seen that drug come back on my shelf that, at 340B. So I bill out for a rebate. I collect a rebate. I pass a rebate through to a payer. And, and, and then, oh, shucks. Now I see that that's that's 340B eligible. I need to go back because by contract, you know, my contract with the manufacturer says I need to notify them if there's already been a discount here. Um, so I need to basically notify them and say, oh, yeah, this is 340B. Or the manufacturer might say, hey, um, it, this wasn't filled at one of your pharmacies, PBM, but we have information to say that it was a 340B transaction. So you've billed for a rebate. And it doesn't deserve a rebate because we gave a discount already. And, and so the, the PBM oftentimes is, is the least visible of all intermediaries of 340B transactions. They're sort of a third party. So when, when you know you, you look at the PBM and you say, well, wait a sec, how am I supposed to audit your accuracy PBM on, on these transactions? And the answer is you have very, very limited auditing rights because they don't even know what's 340B unless they've dispensed it from their own pharmacy. So, and and even that could take weeks. So it's it's really, really tricky because then you'd have to go back to the 340B entity and say, hey, I want you to share with me which of these transactions were 340B and which of them weren't. And they're going to say, hell with you. I don't have any, I don't have any contract with you. I don't have to share that information. Like that's work that 
you know, I don't have to. So it's it's really, really tough. The, the pharmacy is supposed to take that information and send it on to the PVM in the form of uh, coding claims um, in a certain way. Um, but oftentimes that process, because it's sort of retrospective and after the fact, that that transaction's already been billed, it's already been paid, it's already complete. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so the pharmacy then would have to uncomplete the order, re, you know, re, rebill it and then re get paid. It's, it's, it's a total wreck. Yeah, I'm thinking awesome information. I'm thinking from the buyer perspective again, right? Which is always seems to get the losing end of the deal. I bet some of my PBM expert colleagues from these transparent PBMs would probably have some good insight in this. So call me, by the way, if you do, if you if you hear this. Uh, but it seems to me that from a buyer perspective, you're trying to get the best value, the drugs at the lowest possible cost. The 340B game, if you can find a win-win without all this stuff in the middle, you don't have any visibility of what the what the hospital's paying or, you know, so you don't have visibility. But if you could find a win-win where they were willing to pass on some of those savings, that could be a win-win if we could set all that up. Now, the problem is, um, right, if you don't have visibility, then how are you going to know anyway? But the, but the you're, So you're going to play the rebate game, and I think that's exactly what it is. To me, the rebate game is specialty drugs sold. Uh, well, I'll sell you a Cadillac that's really worth forty thousand, but I'm going to give it to you for sixty thousand. I'll give you two thousand back in a quarterly check, and I'm going to make you smile. I remember getting those checks. You've 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 grossly overpaid for something. I'm going to give you just a sliver of it back. I might even take half of it and call it admin cost and say that I give you all the rebates back. I mean, there's a lot of administration, of course. So I'm going to give you a part of that back, but it's going to feel like a reward and it's going to feel like you're getting a good deal and it's going to feel like you're saving. And I don't think you are. So it seems to me if if there are explorations into, into a win-win uh, with 340B purchasing, there could be as long as that saving, and maybe it's not always direct to direct, right? Is, but maybe it could be. And so if those savings are passed along to the buyer, there seems to be a win there. But I, I think we're wandering in the dark mostly. And again, I bet my PBM friends might have some good insight here, uh, and and maybe you do as well. But it, it still seems like it still seems like a losing game for the buyer either way. Where we stand today, am I am I wrong or or please help? Because how does the buyer get a fair shake in these deals? Yeah, anytime that the buyer is blind to um, w what the true costs are for the care, then then the buyer is. Uh, you know, they're, they're more often than not going to get gamed. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and unfortunately, and this, this is a way heavier topic. This is all of health economics, right? This is um, basically healthcare economics uh, uh, is you have a, a smaller number covering the costs of other folks. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have commercial payer patients and, uh, uh, and, and to some degree, Medicare and Medicare Advantage patients that are subsidizing the costs of other care, namely Medicaid and uninsured. Um, and so it, in doing so, it's hard to just say, well, hey, I, you know, I, I, I want to get a fair price compared to some of the other contracts that you're doing on that side of the business. Well, if you're only getting paid 40 cents on the dollar for a Medicaid claim, it's not exactly apples and, and apples. So, um, but if you say as, as a commercial payer, listen, I, I'm willing to pay a, a fair price for this, but I define fair as actual acquisition cost plus, uh, mm -hmm. not whatever, you know, average wholesale, price, not whatever rack rate charge, less a discount. That's not, that's not what I want to pay. I want to pay cost plus, um, you know, and no free advertisements, but I think that's what Cuban has really gotten right in the market is to say it's fair for each provider to get some some profit margin, um, but it's also fair for the payer to pay cost plus. And you should be transparent with with the way that that your cost structure is and your um, you know your your profit is. I mean, because you should get a fair profit, just like any other industry. I mean, same thing. You go to Target, I'll tell you my wife only shops at Target because she loves that little gift card reimbursement thingy that that they give you. It's the same thing. Well you're charging a higher markup. Um, but you know, I, I get my little check. 
uh, it's it's the exact same premise. Yeah, we are we are simple creatures, aren't we? I mean, I studied behavior modification as one of my majors in college, and certainly I see it played out very well. It's certainly uh, come to my advantage in leading HR and motivating people, and it can be used for a lot of good. And then we see these programs, you know, and these store ones are silly. We joke about Kohl's cash, and those are those are silly, and you know, they're not really you're not really maybe saving all you think, but to get that reward is like this little high. And as we kind of bring it home, Vinny, and I, I greatly appreciate your time today and your insight. My my kind of outcome of this is that 340B, like many things, was is a appears to be a good program intended for good purposes. And then um, as people we are, sometimes we slip and fall and we we get greedy and so forth. But in a lot of a lot of times I think that 340B is wholly underutilized, is what I'm hearing by hospitals, first of all. Uh, but then it's not, then this gain that they get on this side is not passed along, is not being passed along on this side. And I think that would be the lesson if you're with us, a hospital system or a nonprofit today, is that uh, you have an obligation to your community to pass these things along in different ways. Maybe it's not direct on that one purchase of the 340B drug, uh, but it appears that's coming up short in many cases. And so... Um, a lot of this, some of this falls back to integrity and responsibility and a nonprofit hospital is supposed to serve the community in which it's not paying any taxes and it's getting a break on taxes. And I think the health of a community uh, really should be one of the major ratings for each nonprofit hospital system. If they're ravaging the community and there's 4,000 lawsuits in each county, uh, I'm not, you know, right, I'm not impressed and I feel, I don't know if that's sustainable. I think that's a lot of the theme of this discussion of is any of this sustainable? You can run over the buyer, um, but what what who wins if everything crashes? And so um, it's a bit of a depressing story. Uh, but the fight continues, and there are opportunities, I think, with 340B that I'm seeing, uh, a lot of missed opportunity. And so, Vinny, if anyone wanted to reach you, uh, what would be contact information for them to do that? Yeah, um, and I can put it in the chat. Um okay. And I'm, I'm super grateful to be here today. Um, I'll make sure that it for, is. for the recording. Are you able to? I mean, if someone is yeah. recording, yeah, well. at junction health.com. Yeah. Um, yeah. put it in there. I don't, hosts and panelists. I th I think that might just be going to us. I don't know if I can. I can put it in the note if you're if yeah. whatever you'd like me to yeah, share. People, you at junction health.com. Junction health. Um, and, and like I mentioned, that's, that's, that's all we do. That's, um, when I worked for the PBM, it was, it was an area that the PBM really had no control over was, mm -hmm. uh, the costs of local infusion because the PBM was like, Hey, I've got control over specialty drugs. I just build and buy specialty pharmacies. No problem. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's mail service type stuff. Um, for, for care that needs to be provided in a local community, like infusions and, you know, uh, radiology imaging like there there's a lot of things that have to be done um you know sort of at at local location and that's where that's where you can affect um the the cost of 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 care by saying hey i want to find a provider that can participate in something like this and i want to get into a unique uh, arrangement with them and there are 14,000 um federally qualified health center locations throughout the country um, that could be doing infusions on site. They could, they're in your neighborhoods. Um, so, uh, and they could be doing specialty pharmacy prescriptions. And yes, I see this kind of plan sponsor um, get access to 340B. You can get a share of it. I mean, it, if you say, hey, I want all of the discount, well, what's the incentive for that provider to give that care? But if you say, hey, I, you know, I just want to, I want to do better than I'm getting gouged elsewhere. And, and, and you can, um, have my volumes and some spread in exchange uh, for some savings, some break on this, then you're going to find that you'll you'll find participants, especially when it's not a completely, you know, locked out monopolistic market when it's saturated with providers. So that would be my takeaway today is to to be willing to go out of your way, um, even as an employer, as a as a plan sponsor, to to look at local 340B providers and, and talk to them and say, I've got high cost patients, just like J and J got sued by one of their employees. You say, Hey, I've got high cost patients. I'm trying to find ways to save money. I'm trying to act as an appropriate fiduciary 
is there a way that you can help me out here? And so I never really asked you for this and maybe that was just a part of it, but maybe you have kind of a, a 30 second as we close here, a 30 second elevator speech of what specifically when people should call you for Junction Health. Is that what you're doing? We part, basically we so we've we've got our first partnership in the, in the state of Florida that um, is a health center that is basically looking to expand their services. Uh, they're 340B eligible. They don't do infusions today. They don't know how to do infusions. Mm -hmm. So we're going to come out. We're going to build it. We're going to operate it. We're going to negotiate with third party payers. Um, and then that's that's the proof of concept. And from there, I'm actually starting on the payer side and saying, where are the biggest headaches? Where are the monopolies? Um, where do you not get a break on these most expensive drugs? Because we'll come to your neighborhood, we'll find a health center to partner with, um, and we'll give them an opportunity for, for new revenues that they didn't have before, and we'll give you a break on your infusion costs. That's the whole point of, of why we exist. Nice. Yeah, it seems to me on just the note of unsustainability and we'll close, but I mean, I think employers, if this, if pharmacy and, and is, costs are not on your radar, uh, I would bump them to the maybe the top of the list or near the top of the list. It seems to me the weight loss drugs that are coming out, these and the cancer infusion drugs, these there's new drugs. When I talked to the CFO when I started at Merrill Steel, he had been there 25 years. He said, Matt, when I started, uh, pharmacy was 4% of our cost. Today it's 20, 25% of our cost. So not only are there these highly innovative drugs and so forth coming out, the amount of prescribing, it seems to have increased exponentially. And to manage a health plan, we're going to need to be able to manage the pharmacy costs within that. And could it get to a point where we even need to exclude things off, off the uh, formulary? Maybe. Uh, it seems to be heading that way. Some jokingly call it Pharmageddon. Uh, but, um, right. So this is a big deal and certainly want to thank, uh, Vinny for being here today in this discussion. And, uh, so thank you again and certainly keep in touch. Thanks all.